Right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending this joint employment and media team webinar on Mr Rafiq's claim against Yorkshire County Cricket Club. I'm Paris Gracia, and I'm joint head of the employment and discrimination team here at Doughty Street Chambers. And I, along with my brilliant colleagues, Jennifer Robinson and Margarita Cornalia, acted for Mr Rafiq's claims against the club. This webinar will last approximately an hour and will cover the following matters. Richard, if we could go to the next slide. Um, firstly, Margarita will be addressing the background to Mr Rafiq's claims and giving an overview to the various claims advanced against the club. I will then address the issue of limitation that arose in this claim and the various arguments advanced to persuade the tribunal to accept jurisdiction over this matter. Thirdly, Jennifer Robinson will cover the various media issues arising in this claim, including the heavy involvement of the national and international media throughout. Last but not least, we will hear from Mr Rafiq himself about his motivations for bringing his claims and his experiences via a question and answer session with Jen. We expect our presentations to last approximately 45 minutes and we'll conclude with a short open question and answer session at the end. Um, before I hand over to Margarita, I would just like to remind attendees to use the Q&A button um, to raise any questions that they may have of any of our speakers today. As you will all appreciate, given the large number of you attending, it may be that we're unable to answer all of your questions during this webinar. If we can't answer your questions, please do feel free to get in touch with Jen, Margarita or I following this webinar and we'll try our best to answer your outstanding queries. Our emails are on the slide um, before you and are also available on the Doughty Street website. We hope you find the webinar interesting and useful and I'll now hand over to Margarita. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paras, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm struggling slightly with the Wi-Fi here in Chambers, so if I drop out, my apologies, um, but hopefully you'll be able to hear everything fine. Um, Richard, could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so I'd like to start uh, with the end of proceedings almost, so at the, rather than at the start, um, at the end of Azim's claim in the employment tribunals. Um, and I'd like to start by looking at the consequences of Mr. Rafiq's claim. Um, so as you'll see on the slide, there was, and as Paris just mentioned, there was significant media focus um, around the issues that Mr. Rafiq was raising about racism in sport. Um, and, and as you'll see in that Guardian article um, copied there, um, there was increasing attention churned to uh, the issue of racism. And, and the article there cites um, a recent research report into talent development, which showed how class and, eth and ethnic disparities really do uh, obstacle progression within cricket. And um, what, what this case um, and what this, what these various media articles highlight are the structural issues uh, within sport. Um, on the facts of this case, cricket, um, but, but I've certainly had other experiences acting for claimants in other sports, um, for athletes in other sports who have faced hardship because uh, of their backgrounds or their gender. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to applaud Mr. Rafiq for having had the, car the courage to speak up and to bring this to the attention of the national and international press um, and thus to reach the attention of, the, of, of politicians and legislators, as you'll hear from him. As I'm sure he'll, he'll say himself, it was a grueling and deeply traumatizing experience uh, and so profoundly difficult for him personally, but equally was profoundly significant uh, in raising attention about the issues of discrimination that pervade sports structures. Um, Richard, next slide, please. Now I'd like to first briefly introduce you to the two parties to this claim, and then I'll run through the facts and the summary of the claims that Mr. Rafiq brought. Uh, so first of all, the claim was brought against uh, Yorkshire County Cricket Club. Now, um, in just to give you a, a, a brief overview and background of this uh, sports club. Now, in, in 1992, Mr. Tendulkar was the first overseas player signed by uh, Yorkshire Cricket Club following the abandonment, abandonment of its birthright policy. And indeed, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Fletcher, an academic, explains in a, in a really interesting uh, 
academic study of, of um, racism within Yorkshire, um, he explains that uh, the exclusivity of Yorkshire Con County Cr Cricket Club, um, that exclusivity is well illustrated by its birthright policy, which restricted participation for, uh, for the county team to, to those people born within the country's boundaries until 1992. Um, and what Fletcher sa says is that this policy added to the perception that the club did not welcome outsiders um, and created an increasing sort of divisiveness uh, between the us and the them. Um, so there's, there's quite interesting academic studies existing uh, about uh, some, some, some difficulties that the club was, was having when it comes to sort of inclusivity um, and attraction of foreign talent. Um, and indeed in 1999, uh, Mr. Khan published an article in The Independent entitled Yorkshire is attacked for cricketing apartheid. Um, and he accused uh, Yorkshire Cricket Club of bypassing local Asian talent. Um, and there's multiple players uh, of whom you could read extensively in the press, uh, whose names are on the slide there, um, who have been reported to have suffered ill treatment and discriminatory treatment at the hands of the club. Um, and I would certainly recommend looking at all that material, which is publicly available. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, now, this is just a very brief introduction uh, to Azim um, Rafiq. Um, you'll have the chance to meet him uh, later on, so I won't say much about him, um, but you, I'm sure you, you, uh, you will have heard of him. He's an incredibly talented uh, uh, player, and he was engaged by Yorkshire County Cricket Club on two occasions between 2008 and 2014, and again between 2016 and 2018. Um, now the latter uh, period of his engagement was particularly uh, the focus of his claims. Um, and obviously uh, Mr. Rafiq is of Pakistani descent. Now moving on to the next slide, please. Um, so just a brief summary of what Mr. Rafiq was claiming. Um, so first of all, he's fi he filed his claim in December of 2020, and he brought claims in direct discrimination, harassment, victimization, and detriment. The factual basis for these claims was were allegations that, that Mr. Rafiq had been subjected to a continuing culture um, of, of racism, per perpetuated by the respondents, coaches, its players, its employees and or agents. Um, he highlighted in particular uh, the issue of a cemented culture of dressing room banter, which included repeated racist comments, including you lot sit over there, go back from where you came from. So quite upsetting comments that, that were uh, described and perceived as just standard um, changing room banter, but which obviously had an incredibly upsetting impact on those players whom uh, those comments related to. Um, there was also a cemented drinking culture, a lack of facilities for halal food uh, for Muslim players, um, and, and, and continuing uh, commenting um, on race and ethnic background. Um, the claimant also relied, well, Mr. Rafiq also, also relied in his, in his claim on specific instances of ill treatment which happened to him. Um, so he mentions nicknames that were used to refer to him. Um, he mentions in particular the difficulties he was having in sourcing opportunities for progression, in developing his red ball cricket, in, in, in being able to take advantage of really every opportunity that, that was there for him um, and which would have allowed him to progress within the sport. Equally, he, he raises concern about uh, failure to support him um, during periods of significant personal uh, difficulties, um, which he perceived was different uh, to the support which was provided to players which didn't share his um, protected characteristic. So on the basis of a combination of a culture of institutional racism and uh, instances of racist conduct which were personal to Mr. Rafiq, on the basis of that 
factual scenario, he filed um, the claims that are before you on the slides. Now, just to give you a quick overview of those claims, um, Richard, to the next slide, please. Um, the first claim was a claim of direct discrimination under Section 13 of the Equality Act, um, and the dis direct discrimination claim and the harassment claim, uh, which is described in the next slide, uh, rely on, 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 this, on, on a similar set of facts, and in particular, the respondent's continuing failure to take action um, about this uh, continuing discriminatory state of affairs. Um, until it, it, it uh, decided to investigate Mr. Rafiq's complaints in September 2020. So the, the basis for the direct discrimination claim and for the harassment claim uh, included this continuing failure to act uh, on a discriminatory state of affairs that um, placed players like Mr. Rafiq at a significant disadvantage. Um, moving on, please. So again, the harassment claim hinged on the same failure to act um, and on the uh, banter and commenting and, and, and racist uh, jokes that, that significantly impacted uh, Mr. Rafiq's ability to progress within the club. Uh, and moving to the next slide, please, Richard. The final two claims, again, are very much overlapping, so victimization and, and detriment. Victimization is a discrimination complaint. Detriment is a claim brought under the Employment Rights Act. Um, and the basis for these two claims uh, were Mr. Rafiq's disclosures uh, to employees of Yorkshire Cricket Club and the media about the treatment that he had been subjected to. Um, so Mr. Rafiq informed Mr. Malik, who was the head of diversity within a Yorkshire Crit Cricket Club uh, in April and August 2018, um, of the conduct uh, that he deemed discriminatory and unfair to which he had been subjected. He then again informed um, Mr. Arthur and Mr. Moxon of Yorkshire Cricket Club of these same concerns in August 2020, uh, in August 2018. Um, so if you recall what I said at the beginning, um, Mr. Rafiq was contracted uh, in two uh, different time periods. The second ended in 2018. So around the end of that contract, uh, he raised concerns about racist treatment um, with various individuals within Yorkshire Cricket Club, uh, but again, no action was taken on them at the time. Um, Mr. Rafiq was then released only a few days after raising these concerns, um, and, and he spent a period of time uh, reckoning with what had happened to him before filing his claim with the tribunal. Um, uh, and before going to the media with, with, with his concerns, which he did uh, in August 2020, so about two years after being released. Um, and, and so his victimization and detriment claims are based on these disclosures, the disclosures internally to, uh, to, to club officials and the disclosures to the media. Mr. Rafiq argues in his claim that as a result of raising these matters internally, he was released by the respondent in 2018, and that that, that was a form of det detriment um, in violation of both the victimization provisions and the detriment provisions. Um, and secondly, uh, Mr. Rafiq complained of other forms of detriment that took place after his disclosures to the media in 2020, which included a blog post being published uh, online uh, describing him as discourteous uh, and several other matters. Um, so finally, just moving on to the last slide before I hand over uh, to Paris to run you through the limitation issues in this claim, um, a brief uh, view, overview of the procedural history. Um, so the claim was filed in December 2020, as I, know, as I mentioned, it mostly related to events that took place in, in the run up to, 20, to, to August, September 2018. Um, so there was quite a gap in time between when the ET1 was filed and the concerns that the that the claimant had raised, um, which created a jurisdictional or time limit issue, um, which Paras will then run you through. Um, the first preliminary hearing was held in February of 2021. During that preliminary hearing, the respondent applied to um, 
list a separate substantive preliminary hearing to consider the issue of time and jurisdiction. The reason for doing so is if they won on the issues of time, then quite a basically most of Mr. Rafiq's claim would have been struck out. So it was quite an important uh, second preliminary hearing. Shortly before that second preliminary hearing originally scheduled to take place in June 2021, um, the respondent uh, objected uh, to the claimant's witness statement. It considered that the witness statement was too extensive and included uh, allegations that were blemishing of the respondent and irrelevant. It therefore applied to redact the claimant's witness statement. At the same time, the claimant applied for a specific disclosure of the internal investigation which the respondent had carried out into Mr. Rafiq's concerns starting in September 2020, so right after uh, Mr. Rafiq went to the media. Um, the respondent refused to disclose um, its internal investigation report. On the morning of, 10th, uh, of the 10th of September, which was the rescheduled date for that PH, um, the respondent disclosed a statement summarizing the report and indicating that a number of allegations of discrimination had been upheld, but it continued to refuse to disclose the entire um, uh, investigation report. Um, we then attended the preliminary hearing in September and managed to obtain an order to get that um, report, but shortly thereafter the claimant's uh, case was settled um, and he was then called to give evidence to Parliament on the experience that he had. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a whistle stop tour of, of the case. It's quite a complex case, so my apologies if I didn't summarize, summarize it as efficiently as I could have, um, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a background to the claims so that you can start engaging with the issues that uh, Paris will will discuss now um, and, and in the conversation with Jen and uh, Azim thereafter. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Margarita, for that overview. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be looking at the various limitation issues that arose in Azim's case. But before I delve into that, um, I'd like to just give a brief overview of the relevant statutory provisions governing discrimination whistleblowing claims. Firstly, as you'll see from the slide, all discrimination claims before the Employment Tribunal are subject to the limitation period set out in Section 123 of the Equality Act, whereas whistleblowing detriment claims are subject to the limitation period set out in Section 48.3 of the Employment Rights Act. Um, all of the claims that Margarita has just um, outlined and, and are relevant to Mr. Rafiq's litigation before the Employment Tribunal have a primary limitation period of three months from the date of the act or remission complained about, subject to the ACAS early conciliation process, which can sometimes extend that limitation period for approximately further two months. Now, that's the primary limitation period. There are exceptions to that provision position, as we can see on the next slide. Now, both the Equality Act and the Employment Rights Act allow for claims to be brought where an act extends over a period, also, also known as a continuing act. Where this principle applies, it's the end date of the act which applies for limitation purposes, and time starts to run for bringing a claim for discrimination or whistleblowing from the end date of that act. Leaving that aside, there are also other exceptions which made under statute for time to be extended in bringing discrimination and whistleblowing claims. For discrimination claims under the Equality Act, um, the tribunal has a discretion to extend time to bring a claim for such a period as the tribunal thinks is just and equitable, which is a wide ranging discretion and enables the tribunal to consider all of the circumstances of the case in deciding whether to extend time or not. Now, the position for whistleblowing detriment claims is slightly different. It's more restrictive, as can be seen under the wording of Section 48.3b of the Employment Rights Act. And that only allows an extension of time for whistleblowing detriment claims if the tribunal is satisfied that it was not reasonably practicable for the complaint to be presented within the limitation period, that's the primary limitation period, and is presented within such further period as the ET finds reasonable. Now, it's worth looking at the summary timeline on the next page to see how the statutory provisions interlink into Mr. Rafiq's claim, because what you can see here, and as Margarita's touched upon, um, is on the 22nd and 23rd of August 2018, Mr. Rafiq made a complaint of race discrimination, which he contended was either a protected act under the Equality Act or a public interest disclosure. Then what happened next was on the 6th of September, for the purposes of these, this timeline, Mr. Rafiq has informed his contract would not be renewed. 
which is also contended to be a detriment or an act of victimization linked to the preceding protected acts on the 22nd and 23rd of August. In May 2020, as we all know, the Black Lives Matter movement gained prominence both in the UK and globally. And on the 17th of August and the 2nd of September 2020, Mr. Rafiq gave interviews to Wisden.com and ESPN Crick Info, which were also alleged in this claim to be protected acts and public interest disclosures to the media. The earlier disclosures were to the employer, but the latter disclosures were contended to be within to, to the media. What happens next is on the 3rd of September 2020, the Cricket Club, Yorkshire County Cricket Club, announced an investigation into the allegations raised by Mr. Rafiq. And on the 11th of December 2020, Mr. Rafiq submits his ET1 after a period of ACAS early conciliation. And as can be garnered from this timeline, there's approximately a period of about two years from the notification of the termination of Mr. Rafiq's contract with the Cricket Club and the submission of his ET1. So plainly, whichever way you look at this, um, his claims are plainly falling outside the primary time, time period for bringing both discrimination and whistleblowing claims um, by, by, by some distance. So one of the things we, we argued, if we go to the next slide, um, is that um, in line with the underlying substance of Mr. Rafiq's claim um, against the club was that um, he was effectively subject to a discriminatory state of affairs by the club as per the well-known case of Hendricks. Um, and that's one, one of the limbs of the argument was that the club's refusal to investigate his allegations of racism until September 2020 was evidence of such a state of affairs. Now, there, there's two elements which Marguerite has already earlier uh, addressed. There's the acts of direct discrimination and harassment, which took place between 2016 and 18. And then what we alleged was a continuing state of affairs from that date and indeed earlier, which permeated, we say, the club's um, inability or, or reluctance to investigate his concerns for a, a period extending until September 2020. Now, if, if the tribunal had accepted that, um, uh, any preliminary hearing, that could have had the effect of extending limitation such that Mr. Rafiq would have been able to pursue his claims at a final hearing in totality, linking the events from 2016 to 18 with the investigation and providing a link between the in-time allegations in 2020 and of course historical matters which fell outside the primary limitation period. If we go to the next slide. One, one of the issues with this argument um, about the continuing state of affairs that could have been raised was the fact that of course Mr Rafiq was no longer in employment with the club between 2019 and 2020. His employment had ceased um, in 2018. And so it could have been said that any state of affairs, discriminatory or otherwise, or any act um, couldn't continue or survive the ending of the employment relationship Mr. between Mr. Rafiq and the club. Now, that contention overlooks, of course, the provisions of Section 108.1 of the Equality Act, which enables discrimination claims to be advanced even when an employment relationship has ended, um, and also the House of Lords decision in Relaxian Group, um, in 2003, which made clear that discrimination claims could be brought after employment had ended, provided there was a substantive proximate connection between the discriminatory act and the employment relationship. In Mr. Rafiq's case, of course, we were contending that the very investigation that the club were conducting in September 2020 or starting was looking at Mr. Rafiq's allegations whilst he was still employed by them, um, i.e. allegations of discrimination whilst he was employed by the club. If we go to the next slide. Now, in the event that those arguments weren't to find favour with the tribunal, our fallback position was effectively that the tribunal should extend time in any event. And Mr Rafiq contended that the following factors meant that the tribunal should exercise its discretion to extend time on either a just and equitable basis under the Equality Act, or to find it was not reasonably practicable for him to present his claims any sooner than December 2020 um, under the Employment Rights Act. And, and the four reasons, five reasons are, are stipulated on the slide there. Firstly, Mr. Rafiq was suffering from um, mental illness in the intervening period. Secondly, um, he was suffering from significant financial strain from obviously losing his job and being out of work, could not afford legal advice at the time. Thirdly, Mr. Rafiq was still in a state of uh, bereavement um, due to the loss of his son in May 2018. Fourthly, the preval prevalence of the Black Lives Matter movement in May 2020. And then finally, and, and, and we see this as discrimination in employment practitioners from time to time acting for claimants, the real concern about retaliation um, from his ex-employer 
and or long-term career damage if he pursued his claims to the tribunal. Now, the, the, the fact is, if we go into the next slide listed there, um, we're really focused on why Mr. Rafiq hadn't filed his claim any earlier or, or within the primary limitation period. One of the factors that a tribunal needs to consider when exercising its discretion to extend time is, of course, to consider prejudice to Yorkshire County Cricket Club in defending an out-of-time claim. And, and, and the factors which we argued militated against giving too much credence, too much weight to the potential prejudice the club might suffer was the fact that firstly, the club were going to uh, conduct an investigation into his allegations in any event. And that secondly, the evidential material considered by the club would be available to the tribunal, thereby ameliorating any assertions by the club that um, forensic prejudice would be suffered by them through the fluxion of time. Thirdly, there was also the point that the investigation by the club would traverse similar evidential material as that of an ET um, in considering Mr. Rafiq's claim. And finally, that there was a strong public interest in the tribunal accepting jurisdiction over this claim, given that it is the judicial body tasked for determining discrimination and whistleblowing claims in the employment sphere. We go on to the next slide, um, Richard. Now, the, the final point I really wanted to touch upon was, was this, and it, it's effectively um, the desirability of a holding preliminary hearing in claims such as Mr. Rafiq's to determine limitation issues. Now, on the one hand, from an employer's perspective or a respondent's perspective, we can see that the prospect of a lengthy hearing dealing with historical allegations of discrimination or public interest disclosure detriment, when those matters could be excised from proceedings is a powerful incentive to have such a hearing at an early stage, at a preliminary stage, to reduce the evidential material contested at a final hearing. The problem with that, of course, is from a claimant's perspective, such a hearing coming as it does prior to full disclosure and witness evidence may hamper a claimant's ability to present his or her full case and also invite the drawing of inferences supportive of a discrimination of, of both discrimination and evidential material which may assist in demonstrating a discriminatory state of affairs. Now, it's difficult to sometimes assess where the balance lies, but of course, in Mr. Rafiq's case, the fact that he was contending that there was a discriminatory state of affairs um, extending over a long period of time was crucial and effectively intertwined with his claims. Now, if we go to the next slide, what we can see is the case law at EAT level as to whether it's appropriate to convene a preliminary hearing in these circumstances, i.e. when the discriminatory state of affairs is alleged, um, it isn't, it isn't that clear. Um, if you look at the case of Sridhar, um, at paragraph 70 to 72, it's broadly generally supportive of, of our position, Mr. Rafiq's position, of allowing the tribunal at a final hearing to determine issues pertaining to a discriminatory state of affairs. However, if you look at the case of EVX at paragraph 50, that appears to provide some guidance on how a tribunal at a preliminary hearing could approach a strikeout on limitation issues where a discriminatory state of affairs is alleged. Now, often these things, with most things in litigation, I suppose, depend on the facts of the case, the claims being advanced, as well as the leaning of the employment judge considering such an application. But the danger of, of a proceeding on this basis, and, and Marguerite has touched upon this about the witness statements that we prepared on behalf of Mr. Rafiq, is that um, evidential material has to be brought before the tribunal in order for them to draw inferences as to the existence of a state of affairs. Where such evidence is being adduced, in effect, the preliminary hearing is being uh, altered into a contested mini trial, where allegations would probably be better, better left to a determination at a final hearing. Um, as you can appreciate, the limitation aspects, as well as with other aspects in this case, um, it wasn't entirely straightforward. It wasn't a straightforward case to run or plead for that matter. However, it would have been a very, very interesting preliminary hearing had we managed to get that far. Um, but, but obviously, um, be because of the great offer and settlements offered by the club, um, it was a good result for Mr. Rafiq to um, compromise matters without an NDA. And, and unfortunately, we won't get to see what the tribunal would have made of this um, had it gone to a final hearing. Um, th those are the matters I just wanted to address you all on the limitation period um, aspects of this claim. And um, thank you for listening. And I'll now hand over to Jennifer Robinson. Well, good evening, everyone from Australia, where I'm joining you from. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all and really great to have Azim joining us for a Dowdy Street event. Uh, when Paris first reached out to me about this case, it was clear in his assessment and in mine 
that an interdisciplinary team was going to be necessary for this case to adequately deal with the employment law issues, but also the very uh, pressing media law and reputation management issues that were already arising in this case before we were brought on. Given the nature of the case, the media involvement already and the, the likelihood of further media coverage in the future, but also importantly because of Azim's stated goals and why he spoke out in the first place. So I'm going to address you on four separate questions briefly and as quickly as I can so we can have a Q&A with Azim. First about the broader strategic questions for Azim and his advocacy goals in speaking out about racism and cricket. Second, the reputation and media law issues arising in the case as a result of those stated goals. The events that led up to his appearance and widely publicised appearance at the DCMS Parliamentary Committee and some takeaways from our experiences in this case and in particular on the importance of a media management strategy in cases of this nature. So by the time we met Azim, he had already taken the spontaneous decision to speak out about his experience of racism at Yorkshire in response to the Black Lives Matter movement. So he had already taken this decision that after reflection and the widespread media coverage that it that had followed his disclosures, that he wanted to do something about this. And one of the things that struck me most about Azim when I first met him was not just his, the clarity of his sense of purpose and his genuine nature. This, this had happened and he wanted to do something about it but also that it wasn't just about him. He wanted to change cricket. He wanted to make it easier for kids coming up behind him. And that informed everything about our litigation strategy, the employment tribunal claim, and his broader advocacy around the case. So by the time we met, Azim had some goals in mind and we talked these through before we decided to take the employment um, case. And the first of his goals was to raise awareness about what was happening in cricket, the problem at Yorkshire, but more broadly, the second was to ensure that as a result of the uh, media adverse publicity that Yorkshire had faced because of his initial disclosures, they announced an internal investigation, but it wasn't clear what was going to happen with that investigation. So we wanted to make sure that that investigation was effective and that the club would implement the necessary changes as a result of the findings from that internal investigation. The third goal was to hold the club to account for what had happened to him personally, and that's where the employment claim came in. But of course, the employment claim was also important in putting pressure on the club to make sure they did the right thing in the internal investigation. We wanted them to do the right thing. We weren't sure that they would, and in the end, we were proven right that they wouldn't. But that was part of our strategy in bringing the claim. But of course, Azim had broader goals, which involved improve regulatory action, better anti-racism policies and practices and cultures within his club and the rest of cricket. And of course, that's not something that you're going to get from an employment tribunal. That is not a remedy that a tribunal can grant you. So that's why this required a broader strategy. Now, it's important to make clear too that leadership change at the club was not something that Azim had set out to achieve at the outset of the claim. That was something that came up as something that became necessary because of the club's complete mishandling of this entire situation. And I'll address that shortly. So it was these broader goals that informed all of our strategy, both within the employment tribunal and outside of it. Um, so given Azim's decision to take these, uh, to go public with his, his experiences of racism in the club, there are of course legal risks about speaking about racism and in particular naming individuals. And it was important that we were able to advise him about his public advocacy, both in those legal risks and in the risks that it could cause prejudice to his employment tribunal claim and the ongoing internal investigation. I want to also acknowledge that Azim had amazing support from Powers Court, a PR firm that worked with me on Amber Heard's case with respect to uh, the drain debt defamation proceedings. And it was their pro bono support that, that was provided to Azim that I think made all the difference in terms of the way the media cover, covered this case and in Azim being able to achieve his ultimate goals. So just a word quickly on the defamation risks and how we manage them with the employment tribunal claim. Um, speaking out about racism, naming individuals, it is clearly defamatory to al allege that someone has been racist. Um, you will, many of you may remember um, that Frankie Boyle successfully sued the Daily Mirror for calling him a racist comedian back in 2012. And of course, racism is heinous. So if you are accused of racism, it is absolutely going to affect your reputation. So while uh, Frankie Boyle's case took place before the 2013 Defamation Act, it wouldn't be difficult to argue um, under Section 1 of the Defamation Act now that it would cause serious harm to someone's reputation to be accused of racism. Now, of course, in Azim's case, he has very clear defences. Truth, for one, under Section 2, uh, and, of course, uh, the public interest defence under Section 4. But the problem for that for us was Azim didn't need the cost and stress of defamation proceedings if any one of the individuals that he was naming 
was going to sue him for defamation. It's expensive and it's difficult. Clients say to me all the time, well, if it's true, they can't sue me, right? And of course, well, they can. And in fact, people sue all the time to protest their innocence. If we look back as far as uh, Oscar Wilde and his uh, ill thought through criminal libel proceedings against the, the Marquess of Queensbury, right through until Johnny Depp's defamation proceedings against the Sun. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be put to the cost and expense of having to prove those allegations in court. So we didn't want to be in that position. So what's the solution to managing that? For Azim, this was never about naming individuals. It was always about the culture. So he wasn't that interested in naming individuals, but there was a defamation risk. So of course, within the context of the employment proceedings, he had the ability through his witness statements and in those pleadings to put all of those allegations there in a way that was safe. Now, the reasons I say that it has those benefits is of course that as a witness in, in those proceedings and as the claimant in those proceedings, Azim was protected from many defamation claims for anything he says in court. Witnesses in legal proceedings, of course, have absolute privilege uh, for what they say in court, provided that, is, that it is relevant to the subject matter of the proceedings. But the other great benefit is that the media, because employment proceedings are open, or at least final hearings are open to the public, and in some cases, preliminary hearings, uh, the media is entitled to report on employment claims with privilege. So the media can report fair and accurate reports of proceedings under Section 7 of the Defamation Act, uh, amending Section 14 of the Defamation Act 1996 means that the media can report what happens in court. The Employment Tribunal rules allow for journalists, once a witness statement is, is heard in the proceedings, to request that under the Employment Tribunal rules, it's Rule 44, um, which is the equivalent of CPR Part 5. So through the proceedings, Azim could make all of, say, all, all of what he wanted to say about his, his story without the threat of legal proceedings, which was important for us. Now, of course, as you heard earlier from Margarita, uh, Yorkshire took a very obstructive approach to the proceedings. Um, they were attempting, and, and, I, and I, think, I think to say in retrospect, and this is what we were saying at the time, they fundamentally misunderstood the broader reputation and commercial issues for the club in taking the approach that they took in an obstructive and legalistic approach, which resulted in a much bigger problem for the club. But as we saw through the proceedings, Yorkshire was attempting to redact Azim's statement to prevent him being able to tell the full story to the court in a way that was protected. Yorkshire had tried to settle these proceedings using an NDA, and I can say that because Lord Patel made that very clear when he announced the settlement that we negotiated after the public controversy, that they had been trying to uh, settle the case causing with Azim signing an NDA, which would have prevented him talking about what had happened at the club. And on top of that, Yorkshire was refusing to release their internal investigation report, which was their own determination of the facts and what had happened to Azim. So this, they were desperately trying to keep this information quiet. And as we all know, it didn't work. Um, so how did we get to the parliamentary uh, committee hearing? So after Yorkshire's flawed internal investigation, of which we had a copy, but we couldn't talk about it because it was private and they were refusing to publish it. Azim was calling publicly for it to be re released and the club refused. And it was at that point that Azim's advocacy strategy changed and he started to call for leadership change at the club because it was clear that the club was not going to do anything about this. Their investigation was completely flawed. And it was only after that internal investigation report was leaked to the media and people started to see what the club had concluded that we saw a huge national controversy. Of course, within the findings of that, um, and I will use the word that I would never use myself, but was, of course, in the context of this complaint, one of their findings was that using the word packy was merely friendly banter. Now, of course, that is an outrageous and offensive um, conclusion, which was the club's own um, internal report, which saw national media coverage. Everyone from Sajid Javid to the Prime Minister was tweeting that heads needed to roll at Yorkshire, and it suddenly became untenable for the leadership to remain. So our team, in the meantime, our team working with Powers Court, Azim's PR, as part of Azim's broader media strategy and advocacy strategy, we had been briefing members of parliament about what had happened at Yorkshire and about the need for change within cricket. So very quickly, the media coverage off the back of that, public statements from across the political spectrum calling for heads to roll resulted in this invitation from the DCMS committee for Azim to come and speak. In their interim period, Lord Patel was appointed as the head of Yorkshire and took a very different approach from what had been happening before. He immediately, as his first act as chair, wanted to resolve this case. And we were able over a weekend before his first press conference to be able to nut out a very 
what I would say an excellent settlement in terms which didn't include an NDA and allows Dazim to continue his important advocacy for the club. Now, none of this would have happened if Yorkshire had taken a different approach to the case, but that's where we ended up. And the great irony of this is that Azim ended up with a platform at the DCMS Parliamentary Committee. Again, another privileged space where witnesses can give evidence without any risk of legal proceedings. And his entire witness statement is now published on their website and he gave evidence that was televised and became a national news story with privilege. So in fact, we, we ended up with a much bigger platform than the employment tribunal proceedings would ever have offered us because of the way Yorkshire handled the case. And indeed, and my takeaways are before we get on to Azim, the media coverage in this case was essential in the key moments of how this case played out and the opportunities that we had to negotiate a positive outcome for Azim. I think that made all the difference too, in terms of Azim's broad, achieving his broader goals, which I'm excited to have him talk about. But if we look back over the case, the key moments in terms of the procedural developments and the developments that ultimately ended up with a positive outcome revolved around national and international media coverage. Azim's first decision to speak out publicly to the media without legal advice resulted in Yorkshire conducting their internal investigation. That would never have happened if he'd not taken that decision and the, the media coverage that had followed. Through the course of the proceedings, we were limited in what we could and couldn't say at different points. And it was only after that material from the internal investigation was leaked that again, it caused a national controversy and we ended up in a DCMS hearing and change of leadership at Yorkshire. So I think it's really important to consider those questions in the broader co context of the strategy of a case because they were so essential in the way that this case was managed and the outcomes we were able to achieve for Azeem. But more importantly, it's I think it's much better to hear from Azeem than from me. So that was my little overview of the media and reputation management issues. And, and just to say, actually, I wanna ask Azeem about this, but just to say too in closing that the media coverage that associated this case resulted in, in massive reputation management issues for Azim. We were so overwhelmed by the closing of ranks against him and the briefing against him in the media that I, I also want to give, uh, give my thanks to Carter Ruck, who came on board to assist us in managing that for Azim in what was an absolutely horrendous avalanche of um, stories being placed about him that were untrue and unfair. Uh, and I think it's worth bearing that in mind too when you're working on high profile cases, the adverse publicity that your client might face and, and the reputation management that that requires, not just for the case itself, but for that for your client's future career and certainly for Azim, his, his ongoing advocacy and career as an advocate in sport. So without um, further ado, Azim, if I can ask you a couple of questions. Um, first of all, would you mind just explaining for everyone uh, your decision to go public and, and, and how you came to that decision? Yeah, I mean, thanks for having me. Um, thanks for reminding me that I played cricket as well, Margarita. That was nice. Um, <laughs> look, I think uh, in 2020, uh, I was doing an interview around um, my new business that I just started. And it was already on my mind because uh, Black Lives Matter had happened. Um, I've seen Yorkshire put a diversity logo on their on their shoulder, uh, on their shirts. Um, I've seen an interview in the Yorkshire Post uh, about the director of cricket saying he'd never been in a dressing room that was uh, that had ever experienced racism. Um, bearing in mind, I'd sat in a room with him two years earlier, going through my whole experience. So um, there was, this was an interview about my new business. Um, I got asked a question, I got emotional, and I said everything. Um, at that stage, genuinely, I thought I would get a phone call, we would sit down, uh, have a chat. I would get a few answers that I needed to put my uh, sort of jigsaw back together, um, and then try and work out how this will never happen again. That, was, that wasn't forthcoming. Um, then I did another interview, and the initial response was, well, he's not even talking about Yorkshire, uh, which just got me back to how I felt in 2018 when I spoke to them in the room. Um, and then from there on, obviously, getting the legal advice that was coming on board, the internal investigation that was announced. Um, genuinely, we thought they would do the right thing. But as soon as we had that first interview with them, uh, which was an eight hour sort of uh, thing with Squire Pat and Boggs, it became very clear that um, they weren't going to do the right thing. And I think as challenging as um, the employment tribunal, as, as you guys know, was for me, I found it incredibly tough. Um, actually, looking back at it, it, it did exactly what it wanted us to do is 
making sure that the club couldn't just do an internal investigation and um, get everything to go quiet because the pressure of the ET just kept making them, um, well, make mistakes in trying to cover it up, which in the effect, as, as you've said as well, I think in the end it wasn't what, um, obviously we tried to do the right thing throughout, had the truth on our side, but it was the way Yorkshire behaved that uh, ended up becoming the car crash that it did. And Azim, for you personally, I know it's been very difficult. Can you tell us a little bit about what, it, not just the employment tribunals themselves, your experience of the, of the proceedings, but the broader context in which you've had to, what you dealt with in terms of taking on this cultural change at the club and in cricket? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't naive. I knew, uh, and I was very clear from the offset that I'm not sitting here saying I'm perfect, everyone else is terrible. Uh, it was never about that. And it was never about individuals either. Um, I wasn't naive. I knew things would be thrown back at me. Um, but as you mentioned, after DCMS, um, little did I know it would become to the point where my physical safety has been questioned. I'm um, having to get police involved. Um, again, Carter Rook were amazing coming in when they did to provide that um, to provide that support. Um, but yeah, it was all I wanted is no one else to go through what I did. Um, all I wanted is for people to understand what happens behind these closed doors a little bit, because I think professional sport and uh, the PR, the way things are done th these days, what's reality and uh, what people actually think is completely different. Um, and cricket, cricket for me had got a massive free pass uh, for a very long time. And there's a lot of things within cricket uh, and the behaviours of leaders and institutions uh, that needed to come into the public light. Because I mean, I'm a parent now. Um, and I can't think of letting my son or daughter go into an environment and then having to go through some of the behaviours I sort of went through. And that that was really where where sort of speaking out and then putting my head above the parapet and putting my head on the firing line came from, really. And when you took the decision to speak out, were you, I mean, have you been surprised by the various issues that have come up for you and the different assistance that you've required in the context of this case? Well, I mean, look, one thing, I feel incredibly lucky. Um, I want to talk about some of the positives. I, fe I feel incredibly lucky to have ended up with the team that I've ended up with, uh, Paris, Margarita, um, obviously yourself. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'm going to say it. I, it was a, Paris getting you involved was a massive God gift for me um, because not just from a legal point of view, on a human level, um, the, the difficult times, as you know, and the support that you gave me was um, above and beyond. Um, bringing Mark Leftley in from Power Scott. Again, someone who I can call a friend now, but I remember them days sat here or in my car as I did most of my Zooms from there, um, just thinking, what the hell have I done? But it was at every point uh, that I felt like um, it's going to ruin my life. Um, things are going to be difficult for me. You were that pillar of support. Um, and that, that was huge because understanding uh, where, from my point of view, speaking out and the challenges, but just that human level of understanding uh, is so important. And I found the whole, uh, as you know, the legal side of it, incredibly, incredibly challenging, but just to have from Paris's point of view, the clear, uh, Paris was great, actually. I remember the first Zoom call with Paris. It was just so straight to the point, um, exactly how it is. And that was good because I am emotional and it needed someone in the team to just go, this is it, no emotions, this is how it is. And that really helped. Um, and yeah, just the whole support and again, power, you bringing in Mark um, and Power Scott, um, if it wasn't for some of the hours that Mark spent on the phone with me pro bono, I'm, I'm not sure I'd have carried on, um, especially around um, judicial mediation, which was an interesting couple of days. I'm conscious that we want to open up to other questions, so please start putting your questions into the question and answer box. But but one last question, if you can update us on what's happened since, because I think when I think back to when we first met and we talked about your advocacy goals and we talked about you having a platform to talk about racism and cricket and what you've now achieved, it's remarkable. So could you give everyone an update on, on where we are now and what's happening? Yeah, I mean, I pinch myself. I can't believe the platform that I ended up with um, to be able to drive through what I wanted to. I'm absolutely over the moon with where my club's going, um, to see Yorkshire uh, changing the way it has. Um, and it again shows when you've got a leadership that gets it and understands and wants to do the right thing, 
what a difference it can make in such a short space of time. Um, in Lord Patel, um, we had the first meeting and I didn't agree with everything um, that he said, but all I saw was a person that cared and a person that was willing to do the right thing. And since then, I've seen positives after positives. Uh, they've, he's had to fight himself. Um, but so it's, it's incredibly positive for me after last week and the EGM uh, going through in their favour that my club is intact and moving in a different direction. That's um, obviously a massive relief. Um, and then from a cricket and whole cricket and sport point of view now, to be able to be in the discussions uh, with Sport England and the ECB at board level uh, to implement some of the changes that, uh, from my experience, that I think are necessary. Look, I don't think this is an overnight thing. I think it's going to take time. I think there's going to be mistakes on the way, but I just want the game of cricket to accept that things have not been great and move in the different direction. And Yorkshire being the forefront of that gives me a lot of pleasure. My son's about to turn three. I want him to play cricket. And uh, so I, I am impatient, but I'm just glad that I've got the opportunity to now try and put the establishment, continuously put them under pressure to make sure that they don't uh, change direction again. So what started out not a positive the story, I think has turned into an incredibly positive story. So Azim's done such an amazing job to get to that point. Um, Paris, I guess we should open up to some questions. Indeed. Um, thank you, Jen. Thank you. Mine's mine. <laughs> The Q and A list building up. Um, let, let, let's try and answer as many of them as we can in the limited time we have left. Azim, I think um, a question's been posed, which I think is for you to answer. Do you feel that cricket has been held to account as a result of you speaking out? Um, I think it's in the process. I think it's there's a long way to go. I think Yorkshire's been held to account, um, and that's where it started from. Um, so I'm obviously the things that are happening are incredibly positive. I think. If it hasn't been announced, it's going to be announced uh, quite shortly that they've got a new international commercial sponsor into the club, which is, I mean, unheard of when it comes to county cricket. But it just, again, shows what can be achieved when you have good leadership. Um, and so I think Yorkshire has been held to account. I think cricket is still trying very hard uh, to pretend that it's not as big as it is. But hopefully over time, we can change that and um, get people to understand and see what the benefits of making the sport inclusive uh, to everyone is. Fantastic. Um, I think there's a, a, another question posed by uh, an, an anonymous attendee. Um, what areas of employment whistleblowing P PEDA law do you think needs reform? Um, I, I'm happy to answer um, that from, from my perspective. Margarita, Jen, you, you might have other aspects as well. I mean, for me, um, won't be a massive surprise given I spoke about limitation issues. But the big, big change I think that needs to happen is the basis upon which a tribunal can extend time. I cannot understand why a more restrictive test, i.e. it being not reasonably practicable to present the, um, the claim in time, is used as opposed to the just and equitable extension test and discrimination claims. They both have similar public interest elements to them. They're both similar in terms of approach, effectively victimizing or subjecting someone to a detriment for speaking out. Um, I think it would make sense to reform the extension aspect of the test to just and equitable to ensure that individuals like Azim and other individuals in his situation are able to benefit if they can from an extension of time to enable their claims to be heard. Um, so that's the aspect I would reform. Uh, Margarita, do you, do you have any alternative views of Jen on that? Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, I didn't, but I, I did see that there was a question about um, the basis on which the respondent objected to disclosing the report. Um, and this was during a PH um, that I did the latest one in September um, of last year. Uh, and essentially they were objecting on, on grounds of relevance. Um, they were saying that there were sort of significant parts of the report that were irrelevant, um, that, that the report mentioned um, names of, of people um, and that there was sort of data protection um, issues, considerations that um, essentially mitigate, mitigated against disclosing the report, but ultimately um, that wasn't a particularly persuasive argument in that it was, it was a report that 
dealt uh, explicitly with the same issues that the tribunal was dealing. So ultimately the uh, tribunal didn't give too much weight to, to that, that argument and ordered disclosure of the report uh, with an opportunity to, to, to redact um, any sort of sensitive information uh, that shouldn't have been disclosed, third party sensitive information. Um, but yes, that, that, was, that was the main reason. I don't know if you want to add to it, um, Paris. I'd like no, to. Just, sorry, sorry, Izzy. No, go yeah, ahead. Well, on your, I, I just can't, from my point of view, you talk about systemic and making it difficult for the victims, people who have struggled. I can't understand that from my point of view, how within three months, even, even if I had the finances available, even if I wasn't, uh, even if I was in good mental health, three months is just, um, I just don't understand that. And again, I think if we want to start letting people listen to people and give people justice, um, things like that have got to change. So employers can't just hide behind the technicality. That's a very good point, Azim. I mean, I mean, three months, as you mentioned, is a very short period of time. And of course, there, there have been some discussions about extending the time limits to a period of six months. Um, but it's funny, in, in other areas of law, of course, contract, tort, personal injury, for instance, you have three years. Um, obviously, it's a matter for the legislatures to determine the primary limitation period. But um, what, what you say makes sense, makes sense to a lot of individual claimants who bring discrimination claims. Um, you know, the, the, the short period does cause difficulty um but um we, that's the position of the law at the moment barring some significant change unfortunately um jen th i think there's a question which probably um you might be able to assist with and, and one of the attendees has asked how did um we manage to persuade the respondent to move away from insisting an nda um you want to i i know what i would say to that but i'll, I'll let you answer <laughs> Well, I think this was part and parcel, I think, of Lord Patel's uh, leadership in taking over from Yorkshire. He wanted to acknowledge what had happened. He wanted to take a different approach. And he wanted Azim to be part of the solution. And being part of the solution was allowing him to be able to talk about what had happened at the club so that the club could move forward. And so I think it was, it was a big step for Yorkshire to do that, but I think it was the right decision. And I think that it's actually reflected well on the club in terms of their willingness to step forward and take a very different approach and to be open and transparent about what they're trying to do to change the club. So I think those broader strategic issues were a big decision, uh, a big part of of Lord Patel's decision in that. But of course, we were simply would never have agreed to signing an NDA. And it was always a sticking point for Azim. His, his decision to speak out was because he wanted to change cricket and he wanted to continue to play a role in that. And limiting his own ability to do that was just a non-starter non, non for us. So, um, but I do think that I, I give Lord Patel a lot of credit in the, the approach that he took to our negotiations, to the settlement and to the way he's led the club since. Excellent. Um, I've, I've just seen the time and it looks like we've hit three o'clock and our hour is up, unfortunately. So um, I just want to um, thank thank all the speakers and thank you all for um, attending today um, in today's webinar. We, we hope on, on behalf of all the speakers, you found it illuminating and insightful. Um, if we didn't manage to answer your questions, as I've said earlier, I think, please do feel free to contact any of us to um, to, to ask the questions or, or, or refer to our clerking team. Someone will try and come back to you as soon as we can. Um, we hope that you obviously enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully at some point look forward to meeting some of you in person. Um, but for now, thank you again for attending. And um, thank you, Azim, for attending as well. Um, with that, bid you all farewell. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Okay. Thanks, everyone.